Okay, so uh, this Sunday we're releasing GitLab 8.2, and GitLab 8.2 has a bunch of really cool features. Um, most notably, of course, uh, Git LFS, uh, but there's a bunch of other features, um, and I think it's important that everyone knows what they are and why they are. So today I will talk through them. This is the main ones, of course. There's also a number of other changes and uh, improvements. These are the main ones. So the first feature that we are uh, introducing in 802 is the one that we like so much about Slack. So it's, it's the award emoji. So this allows you to, in any issue or merge request, upvote using emoji. So just like Slack, you can add to any issue or to any merge request, you can add uh, a number of emojis and then uh, what? If you want to add another one, you can just click on it. It's, it's identical to how Slack did it. We had this idea quite a long time ago. And the reason is, is that what you often have in issues that people support and that people like, everyone just does plus one um, like we're used to. And then you get a really long comment thread with no information. So this completely mitigates that problem and it adds a nice feature. And the cool thing about this is that this also um, will allow us to use this as a form of the feedback tracker. So we always use the feedback.gitlab.com to track a request and how many people like something. And this is the first step towards actually doing this in GitLab itself. Uh, you can just upvote things and we can quickly see, oh, this is, has been upvoted a lot. So this first release, uh, it will be still a little bit limited. So you can, you can add any emoji, you can just do you can just give an emoji in your comment and it will appear there. You can add one there. And in future releases, we'll add stuff so that it will be easier to see whether something has a lot um, and that there will be a search function for emoji, etc. By the way, if you have questions, interrupt me, please. The next big yeah. feature that we're introducing with 8.2 is releases. So in Git, you might or might not know, you can tag something. And a tag is like a label. So it points to a certain commit. And a reason why you would use a tag is that you can easily um, make note of a certain point or make a certain release. For instance, in GitLab, we set a tag to a specific commit that we say, okay, this is version 8.2.1. And the nice thing is, is that you can just go you can always refer to that tag. So you can say in Git, oh, I want to see this tag. And you're always pointed to the same commit. And this is really useful when you release software like GitLab itself, where that you want to share with people. Because you can just set a tag for each release. But for some software, there's some more. You want, for instance, to have some notes with every release. Or you want to, for instance, have some sort of an attachment to it because Maybe you compile something with the code, or uh, maybe there's some extra file people need or something else that you want to bring along with the release. So what we did is two tags. We added the ability to have a little bit of text, which is Markdown, which you've all been using, and the ability to add any number of uploads. So we already had tags. That is something that is native in Git. But the re release bit, where you just add a bunch of text and uploads, that is what is new. And it, this is called a release. And the, the reason that it's called a release is because, well, it's like a release of a software, but it's also how GitHub calls it. Um, and in GitHub, these are two distinct things. They work basically the same way, but they have separate pages for them. And we just collapse it, in, collapse it into a single page. So you probably will get a customer asking, oh, do you have releases? And the answer is from 8 to 2 on, yes, we do. Any questions about this? Yeah, what's, uh, what's a good example of how you would use, um, or say an upload, and also comments or, or text? So I imagine that they're not the actual official release notes, right? They would be in the documentation. Um, you could you could use it for actual release notes, um, or you could have it as a glossary of of like, oh, these are the major things that changed. So an example would be um, an application, for instance, a Mac application that you made open source. 
Mac applications come in a little package, but the source code is just like any other source code. So the tag that you would create would point to a commit, and that commit would just be the source code in all. But the little package that is the actual app, you could then add as an attachment. And then in the release notes, you could say, oh, this is released version two of my app. It does this, this, and this. This has changed. These bugs have been fixed. And so you have a whole release management system just in the tags function. So it's quite nice. Make sense, Hayden? Yeah, so would it be the actual like compile binary would be the attachment? Yeah, it's up to you. You can just attach anything. So it's it's okay. completely free to attach anything. Like in any comment in GitLab, you can add any kind of attachment. You can do here the same thing. Got it. And does the attachment actually go into Git? No, it doesn't. It's just attached to this release, to this little extra data uh, with the tag. It's not actually in Git. Got it. So it's not as if you're checking a binary into Git. No, no, if not at all. That. No, and this is Got quite it. nice because these are usually things you do not want to have in your repository, but you just want to ship along yeah. uh, with the release. Cool. Got it. Thank you, mate. Okay. Wait. So, sorry. One more question on that binary. If you do upload a, a file uh, as part of the tag, uh, where does that file live then? Presumably, it is. It's in the repository, but it's not being tracked by. It's not in the Git repository, but it's still. Uh, how does that work? I guess that connection. It works like any other upload. So it's just in the upload directory of your GitLab instance. So like any other upload in GitLab, it lives on your server or wherever you specified it, but not, it, does, it does not live in a repository. Okay, thanks. All right, so that's releases. Really nice feature, has been asked for a lot for a long time. We always felt like, yeah, it's not a really big thing, but made sense, so we added it like this. And I think our implementation is really nice because it's really lightweight, but it does exactly the same thing as GitHub. The next thing I discussed in the last lesson, so I'm just going to quickly glance over it. It's a repository mirroring. Uh, again, it's only for enterprise edition. Um, yeah, and I discussed it last time. So you should know what it is. And if you don't, um, go back. Another thing we added is global milestones. And this is not a really big feature in that it's mostly just an interface change to something that we already had. But it sheds some new light on milestones, which I think are not used very often in uh, organizations and not very often on GitLab.com. And it is something that is quite powerful and will be expanding a lot in the future. So milestone is basically a way to across projects and groups even, to see and combine and see the status of multiple issues and merge requests, many at the same time. Now, what we did in the past is we started with having only milestones per group, per, per project, sorry. So if you had a project, you could have a milestone. In another project, you create another one, but there was no connection between the two. Then what we did is we made it such that if you have a milestone in project A and you have a milestone in project B and they have the same name, and if you go to the group or to the dashboard and two milestones, you could see that milestone as long as it had the same name between the projects and it would be treated as one milestone with multiple projects. Now, that functionality we use actively within GitLab for our releases. So for instance, we create the 8.3 milestone for the next release in every single GitLab project. But it was a bit of a hassle to create it in every single project. So what you can do now is when you create a new milestone from a group, you can say which projects you want that milestone to be in, and it will automatically live in all those different projects. So it's a quick way to create a milestone that covers multiple projects within a group. Does that make sense? Does make sense. The screen you're showing here, though, uh, doesn't show the selector for the projects. Was that in a prior screen, or where is no, that? No, actually, it shows it. You see under description, you see projects, and you see test there. Test is one project, and here you can just type the name of any project, and it will auto-complete the project. So you can just select them, like like as if you're adding a user to something, um, and you can have any number of projects there within the group. 
Okay. So it's really Thanks. it's a really small implementation. It's a really small change, but it sheds some new light on this, and it makes it much easier to use this over many projects. Hey, Job, how many projects make up like a release for us? Like let's say eight dot two. How many uh, projects repos are there roughly? Um, a lot. <laughs> it's um. <laughs> We we have GitLab. GitLab CI has one, right? So GitLab CI no more because that's now so that's one less than you thought we had. But it's so it's GitLab yeah. CE, GitLab EE, Omnibus, and then all the dependencies that we manage separately. So uh, some are a part of GitLab like Workhorse and GitLab Git. Others are not part of GitLab, but we ship them along like the Runner, for instance, which is also a separate repository. So I think all in yeah. all to create GitLab. Of our personal things that we have our own repositories, it might be like 10, maybe less, probably a little bit less. Um, if you take all the dependencies uh, that we have, but we don't have a project for each, it's hundreds. Right. But of our own projects, I think maybe, well, 10, but it depends also on your criteria, because we have, for instance, repositories for our operations for gitlab.com that do not ship necessarily into each release. But a lot of the knowledge that is in there and some of the information goes into the other projects and has to be worked on to be able to release it. So I can't give you a straight answer to that. But I would say That's a lot. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. Thank you. So, so yeah, real quick. Uh, so an example of Global Milestone would be all of these features that you're mentioning that are going to be released on Sunday. These would all have the, like a Global Milestone tag for all of these projects since it's across multiple projects, correct? So we ha actually have a milestone, a global milestone, which is simply 8.2, and it has as date uh, November 22nd. So you can see here November 20, you can see the, the date selector there, where you can set the due date. So that one we set to the 22nd. The title of the milestone is 8.2, and we just add all the projects in which we know there's that, that we have to do certain things before the release. So we would add the project GitLab CE, GitLab EE, Omnibus, and maybe some others. Okay, perfect. And then everyone assigned to that project will see all of this. Yeah, so if you are in any perfect. of those projects, you can go to Milestone View, and you will see this Milestone 8.2 there. So you can do that both from the group level, and then you see for all the projects within the group that have this Milestone, you can see, okay, uh, in GitLab EE, we have to do this. In GitLab CE, we have to do that. Or you can go to one of the projects itself, and you will see that this same Milestone there again, but then only everything related to that project. So in GitLab CE, you will see everything for 8.2 in GitLab CE, all the issues and all the merge requests that relate to this milestone. Thank you. So besides the, these were the like four GitLab things, we also have some really cool changes to GitLab CI which sound a little bit technical, but I want you to see this, and I want you to see, get, a, get a feel a little bit of how, how this works and how this looks, because it's really cool. So what we're introducing in GitLab CI, in GitLab, of which CI is part of, is build artifacts. And what build artifacts are is that when you have a CI process, when you have a build, it is possible that you have some sort of an output. One of the things you can do, for instance, with a build, take that Mac application that I was talking about before. What you could do is you could, for instance, make that little package that contains your whole app, basically your app. You could do that in a CI build. Now, up until 8.2, at the end of your build, you had to put your result of that build, that output, you had to put it somewhere. And we didn't have any functionality to allow you to put it in GitLab somewhere. No, you had to like send it to your, one of your own servers or for instance to your Amazon S3 bucket, something like that. And that's not really convenient when you do this. So what we added is that the option to have an artifact come out of your build. And an artifact is one of these kind of outputs. And this functionality allows you to store it on your GitLab instance. So you don't have to worry anymore about where to store it. Rather, it just stored with your build. And once your build has completed, you can go to your builds in your project and you can just click download and you have there your artifact, whatever came out of that process. 
So what you're seeing here in the screen is two little snippets. And the snippets are examples of how you would configure that in your CI file, in your .gitlab ci.yaml file. The first one shows how you would typically do it, which is you say, OK, I have artifacts. And I want to store whatever comes out of this process that falls under binaries and the .config file. Does it make sense so far? Because it has to make sense for the next part. Yeah, it does. Are these getting stored in LFS? No, these are just getting stored on the server in a direct Okay. Way. Actually, another follow-on question. So a CI builds typically smaller than, um, you know, the compiled app. I'm just wondering because usually build, builds are quite large and typically you don't want to put them in Git, right? So a build is a process. So when we're talking about the CI build or having something, it's just having something run on that runner that is connected to your GitLab instance. So when we're talking about a build, it's for instance, running the test for your application. So for all of the, almost all of the things we do right now with CI, there is no output other than success or failure, right? This is the very foundation of the idea of having a build. You start a process, it runs whatever you tell it to, and then at the end it reports back success or failure. So you run your tests in there and they report back success or failure. Now, you have the option to do other things like building that app. And in that case, you have a whole process, the process that builds the app, for instance, that compiles the app. And then at the end, it spits out that app, like that, that app and that little package. And that can be of any size. There's no real restriction. There's no real rules about this. This can be several megabytes or this can be several gigabytes. So this is basically what it is. And because your runner, every time it starts a new process, it starts completely clean. You don't have the ability to store something there. It's not like it's a server where you build up things. What you want is that every time you run something again, everything else is the same, so that you are sure that that is a clean environment where you can just always run all your tests and it doesn't get affected because one change or another change comes in. So this is the problem we are facing. So what happens right now with these artifacts is that if you define this, that output that you define, like that app, that little package that you have, that actually gets uploaded from the runner to the GitLab instance. And you don't, you don't have to do anything for it. You just have to define it in your CI file, what you see right here, an example of saying, oh, I want to store this. And then GitLab itself will take care of all the uploading. And the only thing you have to do is press the download button in builds. Yup, maybe this is, uh, maybe you've addressed this, but it's not entirely clear to me. But I'm seeing you talking. Oh, can you hear me now? Still not. No? I can. You can't hear me? I can. Oh. Yeah, I can, I can hear you, Ernst. Okay. Uh, well, I'll ask you guys the question and you can relate to Yop. Still not here. <laughs> <laughs> the question is um, when the artifacts go back to the uh, Git, well, to your GitLab instance, uh, do they go to the repository or not? That's question one. Question two is the paths that you show defined here, I'm binaries and dot. I don't know if anyone else is. <laughs> okay. Hey, Yob, can you hear me? This is Hayden. Yob, can you hear me? This is Hayden. Okay, I think Yob's lost audio. Chad, can you hear me? Uh, I I can hear. Yes. Maybe I'm not hearing anyone. Uh, okay, someone can someone chat Yob and mention he's got no audio. I will. Yeah. Uh, I can hear no one. <laughs> hey, let me reconnect my mic. <laughs> can you say okay, something now, someone? No. Yeah. Can you hear me? No. Uh oh. This makes the Q and A a little tough. Yeah, I'll just write it in the chat. There <laughs> there we go. Go. <laughs> um, I think mine are fine. But...
Ernst, are you chatting with uh, Yob? I'm trying to ask my question through the chat window. We'll see if he catches okay. it. Again, yeah, he's but I don't see him responding to the chat in the first place. Hey, Yob, this is Hayden. Can you hear me? Hey, he may not be able to see the chat either. Hey, try again. Yo. Oh. <laughs> I, I would suggest slacking then. Slack. I'm going to yeah. slack him in the sales channel. All right. Uh, I'm hearing something. Ah, can you hear me? Can you hear us yes. now? There we go. Yes. Okay. What, okay happened, there we go. Yo, what happened? We thought we'd lost you. I don't know what happened. I didn't change anything and I just stopped hearing you all. Oh man. It it's must be a cable part. in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ernst, you had a question. Yes, my question was uh, well, I had two questions. One is um, I guess I'm only just realizing the difference between uh, things being stored in the repository I versus. It. I stopped hearing you yes. again. Oh! <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's blue jeans. Anyway, I see it in chat. Do artifacts go to the GitHub okay. repository? And I'll just answer that yes. question. And they do not go to the repository. So the artifacts, they do not get committed in any way. They get stored separately. These are typical things that you do not want, want to store. Okay. And then can you describe the paths? more yes I, i'm hearing you i don't know why <laughs> it's really bad um so the path is just from the root of your repository so what happens is that a runner picks up your repository and it it does whatever you want with it so it, it looks for that specific file in that repository and then it runs all the scripts related to that file so the paths are where it's going to pick up these binaries. So in this case, um, you have a .gitlab CI file. It runs all the scripts in there. And then by the end that it run everything, it will see, OK, what can I find under the folder binaries from the root of the repositories? And I take all, all everything that is there, and I upload it to GitLab. And I take that .config file, and I upload it to GitLab. Does it make sense? So it, so it sounds like you have to know what kind of artifacts you're going to have to make sure that you specify that you want to pick them up and store them? Um, but that's not entirely true because so in the first example, what you're seeing is that we're specifying where the artifacts are. I mean, you should know what they are. You're not just going to randomly um, chip your artifacts. There's no reason to do that. Uh, so in the first example that you see with the paths, we're saying explicitly take what is whatever is in binaries and take the .config file, and I want those things to be the artifacts. However, and this is why I wanted you to understand this well, the second example that you see, uh, you see artifacts untracked true. This is an idea by Sid I heard from Camille, and I think it's genius. Um, and what it does is that Rather than saying, I want to have this and this as an artifact, it, what you're doing is I want to take everything that is not tracked by Git by the end of this process and have that as an artifact. So your Git repository contains a bunch of files. The runner takes those. It runs all the processes that you specify it. And by the end, there are probably some extra files like these things that are in binaries. And so what this option allows you to do is to just, rather than saying, I want to take the specific things from a specific directory. It allows you to just take whatever is not normally in the repository, whatever is new, what is not tracked by Git. Does it make sense? And does it put them in no. the repository? I see people shaking their head. I don't hear you. <laughs> Yo, this is Hayden. Can you hear me? Yes. So when you specify, when it gets the, the builds or the artifacts after the process, does it check them into the repository? No. So you, the artifacts are 
typically not things that you want to check into the repository. They are things that uh, like an app that you packaged or a certain output, and it can be wrong or that can, you know, you might need it for a later step or you might need it for something else, but it's typically things that you do not store in a repository. It would bring other problems with it because a build is something you want to be able to run as many times. You want to be able to have it go wrong. You want to, so you do not want this to influence the current state of your repository. It's something that is triggered. The build is triggered upon changes of your repository and not vice versa. So they're just stored on the GitLab server. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, for, th this is a little bit confusing for some, maybe. Uh, maybe just to clarify the distinction between the repositories, the Git repos, and the GitLab server. They're two separate things. So when when it says when uh, Job says the yeah, the artifacts are stored in Git in GitLab, he means the GitLab server, not the Git repositories, which are on a completely separate file system. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah, hey, that's actually uh, exactly what I'm learning. Uh, it makes sense, and I hadn't really paid attention to it. I'm kind of curious if Job can show us maybe an example of. I'm wondering uh, the repo that we have for the website as an example. I might imagine that some of the binary files that are there, perhaps the images, are not in the Git repo for the for the website, but perhaps they are. Is there a way? Like, how can I tell? I guess when I'm in a project, how can I tell where I am, whether something's in the repo or not? Uh, Ernst, it's it's very simple. Everything that you see under files in a project, that is the repository. So the repository, a Git repository, is not as complex as you think. It's just a directory that is tracked by Git. It's tracked by Git because inside of it, it has a .git directory. You cannot see that because your file system by default hides uh, folders and files that start with a dot. But that is all that is a repository. It's not that complex, and in fact, it's also stored on the file system in your GitLab repository. The distinction is, is that because it's tracked by Git, you have all this overhead. Uh, this is the reason why we say you don't want to put, put big files in your repository. So for things like when you're talking in issues with people, we store it somewhere else than in your repository because we do not want those things to be stored in Git and saved to the history of the repository. The same that if you upload a file or an image to one of the comments, to one of the issues, that gets stored on the GitLab server away from the repository because we do not want to version that information that is ephemeral, that is not something we want to have version. So only the things that we explicitly want to version, we put in repositories. Therefore, build artifacts, which we should be able to generate en masse, they are not stored in repository. So, yeah, can you hear me? Very yes. helpful, thank you. Perfect, okay. So I think for, for me, the confusion is we keep talking about GitLab servers. So on premise, if we have a company, so company A, they have their own repository. They're going to have their own server. So is this stored on their server? So I'm getting kind of confused on this whole GitLab server thing. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, I will, for, the next, for the next class, I'll make a really nice diagram, but I will explain it. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. So <laughs> GitLab you put on one of your own servers. And GitLab itself is just, so that's your own server that has its own file system. And when you put GitLab there, everything is there. In theory, you can put everything on a single machine. You can put it over multiple, but then we're going specific. It's all a single, single server. So that means that on that single server, you put your repositories that are managed by GitLab and anything else that you upload to GitLab, meaning you go into the application on gitlab.yourcompany.com. Anything you put in uploads is also stored on that, on that server. The artifacts that we're talking about, they are also stored on the server. It's just that the repositories, they are just in a separate directory from all the other things. But it's all on a single server, and it's on the server that you install GitLab the software on. So everything is on that same server. Does it make sense? That helped me tremendously, yes. <laughs> Good. So do you all understand what you can do with artifacts and what you can do with the untracked ability? I don't yeah, fully personally understand the untracked. Oops, sorry. 
Sorry, go ahead, Chad. Well, go ahead, Chad. I, I just think, I'd say the the one that's not clear to me is that untrack piece. So my understanding from what Yop and Hayden said on that is it's essentially uh, any artifact that doesn't automatically go to that file system that's being tracked by Git. Yes. So you you have the repository. So you have a project, right? And a part of your project is the repository, and the repository is the bit of the file system that is tracked by Git. So Git has an index of everything that is there. That's the way you should see. That's literally what Git does. It makes an index of everything that is in a certain directory, and it has a certain history. So when you run a build, you things happen in that directory. So you might start off with only having a single file, but your build might be generating other files. So Git sees that you started with only a single file, but there are certain new files in the directory that it's tracking that are not tracked yet by Git. They are new, they are different. So what this ability does is it says, after build is done, look at the repository with Git, because this is what Git does, this is what it's made for, and see what are the new files, which files am I not tracking? And I want to take those files and send them to GitLab as an artifact. That's clear thing, so. For me, it's getting, uh, yeah, much better. Um, yo, one other question. So in the uh, the way the artifact paths are defined over there, it's uh, it's where you pick them up from, right? So artifacts, paths, you go to the folder that's created that's called binaries, you pick everything up that's a binary. It doesn't specify where to dump it. Where does it dump it? Do you do you generate uh, a, a folder in your um, project that's called artifacts, or where does it go? So that is the nice thing. We handle that for you, so you don't have to worry about that. So in the past, this was the issue that you had. You, If you had some sort of output, you had to say, oh, I want to put this here, and I do this and this. And in this case, you don't have to think about it. What we do is we store it on your GitLab server, but you don't have to think about this. The only thing you have to do is you go in your project to builds, and you press download, and you just get the artifacts of that specific build. Uh, yeah, question. So what is the main benefit of, of having the artifacts get pushed to, to GitLab? If you can provide an example or, or some sort of thing, like if we're talking to, to clients and, and, and talking about this, this uh, feature, you know, what is the main benefit they're going to they're gonna see out of this? Sure. When you have a CI, you want to have the ability to have artifacts. That is something that is um, it's a fundamental part of having a CI run. So this makes it much easier to manage those artifacts. You do not have to set up anything external to manage this anymore. And in future updates, we'll add even more advanced functionality that, for instance, allows you to pass artifacts between builds. We'll discuss that at the time. For now, the advantage is that you can manage artifacts very easily. You don't have to worry about it. It's right there in GitLab. You don't have to think about where to store them, what to do with them. You don't have to manage credentials, you just say, I have artifacts, please store them for me. So, yeah, would you recommend, is that, a, is that a question, is that a discovery question we should ask in the process, like, are they, are they storing artifacts? And if they are, then we should talk about that feature? I think that's a good question to ask. A lot of people are. There's a famous program from JFrog called Artifactory that is used often for this, people that run relatively complex applications, they use this quite intensively. So this often happens. Okay, so we, we can assume most people are probably using this, but it's a good validation question to say, assuming you're, you, or if you're using artifacts, uh, one of the features or the advantage of GitLab is it all sits within a GitLab instance. Yeah, yeah, okay. in your CI, that's the idea. It's always within the CI, right? Got it. All right. So the next one, similarly challenging, and that is the ability to cache within your runner. So as you now know, we have a CI run run. Uh, what happens is that a runner grabs the repository, 
and it does something with it, something that you uh, specified. Now, for instance, if you have GitLab and you want to run the tests of GitLab, we have a lot of dependencies in GitLab. So every time a GitLab build starts, what happens is that the runner, the repository gets copied and all the dependencies start installing. But that takes a lot of time and time is money and no one wants to spend a lot of time. You don't want to wait for your builds to complete. So what you can do is you can cache certain things in your build, meaning that in my example where we have to install all these dependencies, what we can do is we can simply cache the result of that installing so that that doesn't have to happen. So that the next time you do a build which has a similarly similar dependencies, the dependencies are already there, it can, the runner will see, oh, I already have those and it won't install them or at least the script that installs them will see, oh, they, these are already here, I can skip this. So this means that your builds can be much, much faster. So for start asking questions, the example that you see here is RSpec is just a type of spec, uh, test one that we use, for instance, for GitLab. And what we say here is we want to cache everything that is not tracked. So this is the same as the last time. I think I heard someone trying to ask a question. No, so, this is, yeah, this is actually pretty good for me. The, um, no, I, I didn't have a question. I was just, I guess, um, when you uh, when you describe that the runner grabs the repository and starts building the dependencies, um, what is there a visual? Is there a, a further explanation you can give on on what that entails? So, I guess sure. it depends on what kind of code you have and what kind of compiler you have, or what? Yeah. No, let's. Let's say you have a folder, uh, your repository is just a directory, right? And in, before you can run a certain test, you have to install a little script that is there. So there's a little script in your repository and you have to install that before you can actually do the test that you want to run. And at installation, what it will do is it will put files there. It will put files in your repository because that is what installing is. It just puts file in a certain location. So what you can do, and what you can do in this example, for instance, what you see is that you can cache, so you can store those things that it installs, those files that it puts in the repository. You can store them for usage in the next build. So that the next time you do the same build, after the first time it's been installed, installation script will see, oh, these files are already here. I can skip this whole part. So that entire duration that installation that is then skipped. And this is what caching is. It is using data that you have retrieved, that you have generated before, reusing it so you don't have to go through the process of installing it or getting it from a server somewhere. To clarify things? Yes, I understand the value of caching. Yes, thank you. So, and again, here we have the option to do this with untracked files. So rather than saying, oh, I want to cache a certain directory, or I want to cache certain files, you can just say, I want to cache everything that Git is not tracking. Therefore, everything that changes in the repository after it's done doing the whole build, I want to cache everything for the next build. This is an extremely nice way to add some sort of caching to your application because in doubt, you can just at this, and if the runner sees that there's things cached, it will make use of it. Now, this is a feature that that has to be implemented by our customers, right? This this doesn't automatically happen. So it's it's extremely valuable for people using GitLab to know about this. Otherwise, they won't be using it. Correct? Yes, this is something that. You, so what you're seeing here is a part of the .gitlab CI YAML script. So if you put in your script somewhere cache colon untracked true, you have this functionality, but you have to do that, of course. The same goes with the last option, by the way, with the artifacts. But this is something we have to market, we have to document really well, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
it's something that people will look for because this is one of the things that, for instance, the famous CI, Travis CI, has had for a really long time to make sure that builds happen quickly. They spend less CPU cycles for each build. Perfect. Thank you. All right. If there's no more questions about this, and as always, feel free to ask me questions about this anytime later because I know this is really complex. But this is really worthwhile. This is really interesting. Like this caching is a quite a big deal. The artifacts is a very big deal that we will be spending a lot on later. And it's cool, like really four parts of our CI product um, and something that people expect from an advanced CI tool. So this is something that we'll get back to later. We'll expand on. We'll make so it's it's important that you understand it more. Bill, do you do you have some data in terms of uh, time saved thanks to the caching that kind of thing uh, that would be helpful for the sales team? Um, if it would work today, I would have told you. No, um, we are. I think we'll deploy it in one of the coming days. So this is not. Uh, we don't have any data. Oh yeah, uh, I couldn't uh, resist uh, adding the one more thing uh, line in here. Of course, as you know, we are introducing Git LFS with this release. Uh, we release GitLab on the 22nd, so that is Sunday. And but we want to market this extra. So Ashley has been in communication with uh, I don't know who. So the actual LFS announcement and the fact that it will be in April 2 will only be Monday. So this is important for you to know, and that's why I didn't even edit here because you know this is all public. Um, about LFS, it is on by default. I will discuss with you what it does, and we'll maybe go into it later more. Um, it's on by default, so that means it will be available for everyone. Our customers all have their own servers, so they do not have to worry about things like gaps and such. It's an extremely powerful feature. I think it will be really, really popular. Of course, in this release, it will still be in like a beta state, so things will be broken, but we'll fix them. I started using it for university also today, and we found some bugs, um, small bugs, but still. And I think it's really exciting. So <laughs> I, I, I already discussed it more. So if you have questions about this, let me know. And I think that was it for today. Are there any questions about anything so far? Yeah, yeah um, I have a question going back to the emojis. Um, just to clarify, is that voting, or the, is the emojis only in the voting for issues, or is it for other pieces within uh, GitLab? It's for issues and merge requests. So this is the prime locations. I wouldn't know where else. We can consider adding it to comments in the future, like in, as, as in Slack, you can add it to any message. But for now, it's only for issues and merge requests. So that in an issue, you have a feature proposal, for instance, people can say, ah, I like this. And in a merge request, people can say, oh, I think this is good, or I think this is bad, uh, or any of the other emojis, such as helicopter. I think this is helicopter. <laughs> And is this a uh, e, both EE and CE feature? Yes, this uh, this is a typical feature that we wouldn't put only in EE. This is truly something that everyone will appreciate. Everyone really likes this kind of feature, so cool. it would be a bad move of us to put this only in EE. And what about releases? Is that EE and CE? It's also EE and CE. Um, okay, that's another thing that is nice to use for everyone. The EE exclusive feature is repository mirroring, um, which is a big feature. It's a complex thing, and it's something that is much more likely to be used by big teams over small teams that use the free version. Cool. And all the yeah. other features we went over today are all uh, both. Yes, that's correct. Repository mirroring is the big EE only feature for this release. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be nice to, if we could, just moving forward, break break out these these features into what category they're in, like CE, both, EE only, just so we know, because I'm taking notes on the side. Um, but I, it seems like you have it in the header there, but just some, just a, um, some advice for me. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. Every feature that I discuss will be both, um, unless I say that it's EE only. And you can see the same reflected in direction. Uh, 
any other okay. transformation. So I, that is, that's the way I like to go forward. What we did do, I discussed this last week as well, is that from now on, uh, with 802 on, for every release, we'll have at least one major EE feature. So for the current release, that is repository mirroring. For the next one, it will be issue weights, et cetera. Okay. Thumbs, thumbs up on that. Good job. Um, uh, question, Yab, uh, and I don't know if we're doing this, and if we're not, if we could, as a suggestion, um, like little video tutorials. So kind of like I think you produced before, kind of like how to do issues and merge requests, but doing short snippets to post out there, uh, like around emojis or whatever these are. Um, that That's super helpful, I think, in a couple ways. One is personally visual to help me learn, but I think it's a lot of things that we can send out or can be part of GitLab University, kind of the open forum where people can go learn um, little aspects or little five minute videos of what is what is repository mirroring, how do I set it up or artifacts and so forth. Yeah, this is a great idea, Chad, and I, I wanted to do this already for a while. So far, I haven't had the time. Um, so basically, feature highlights, I, I, I want to do them in video and in text, because if you have yep. them in text, it makes them Googleable. Um, but in video, yeah, I agree. This is a great idea and I want to do this. I want to do this for all the features, also the older ones, because we have a lot of features, uh, quite cool features that we've had for a long time, like protected branches, which we actually did all the highlights on and everything uh, that yep. we had for months and months and months. And then, you know, we get the phone by and says, oh, we have this. So yeah, no, it's a great idea, Chad, and I'll, uh, I'll prioritize. Yeah, exactly. Because I know for the, I'll speak for the team and it started with me is just as I started identifying a lot of these YouTube videos, classes, whatever it is, putting it in one form just for us to start learning. Um, I know it's been great for me and I've heard feedback from the team, like it's helpful. So yeah, anything we can do to do more of that and refresh some of the older stuff would be great. And then have non, non GitLab people as well. Yeah, it. yeah, I think this is great. I, I wouldn't mind it if people want to help me with this, by the way. Um, so if there's something that you think you know how it works, I can help you record yourself or write write something, but it would be great if other people would also help uh, contribute to GitLab University and do the content that is available in this, uh, in this sense. It's not hard to do. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of time, but requires some effort. And it's, uh, it's really nice. It helps everyone. Um, Yo, is that also something that uh, Heather McNamee should be doing on Monday? Um, it might be something that she would be interested in slash have time for, but I'm very, it's very dangerous for me to say that because of course she's, uh, Ashley already has all kinds of things in mind for her <laughs> when she starts. Uh, this is one of the things she'll be working on. I discussed it with both her and Ashley, yes. But I, I think it's nice um, for everyone. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of time to do something like this. And, and if you write something about a feature or something, it's it's nice. It's something everyone can do. And there's so much material. And there's so much to do. Uh, we could hire an army of people and do the PNL. But, but then yeah. we had our work on this. And then if I may ask one final question about the award emoji. Well, two questions about the award emojis. One is why do we call them award emojis and not just emojis? And the second question is, when you go to uh, kind of the issue overview, do the emojis, sorry, the award emojis show up so that you have it in your issue overview? So first to answer your second question, no. We might do something like that in the future, uh, but as of now, no. That is really hard to put something in an overview because everyone wants everything in the overview and then everything gets really cluttered, etc. Also, counting emoji is not easy. Like, oh, this thing got five, Helicopters and six beers and seven ice cream. So that's uh, that's an issue in itself. So we'll think about that. I think we would want to do something like that. But first question. Yeah, I don't think you call, I'll call it emoji. Um, emoji are the things itself, and we call it award emoji because you award it to an issue or a merger. So you say, oh, I give this, this, and it's not just an emoji. An emoji is the thing itself already. Got it. All right. Um, yeah, the, 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 the reason for the second question, which you answered first, just to, to keep things clear, uh, was um, uh, this, this whole idea, I, I imagine we want to be able to use it to sort through issues and start to get to some sense of what's popular in the community or interesting to the community. Uh, and so 
right now there's not a way to search or sort based on uh, emoji activity, so to speak. Uh, but it sounds like, I think you mentioned that that was something that was going to be coming in the future. Yeah, I, I have to think of a way to do it well. I think the best way probably is to just count the amount of emoji irrespective of what they are. But yes, that is something we have to do in the future because otherwise it wouldn't be easy to sort out what are popular things and what aren't. Um, but yeah, I mean, suggestions are welcome for this. I, I, I don't really think it's a good idea to count every single one or like count whether which is positive and negative. So probably we'll just count the total one. Suggestions are welcome. It's something we want to do, but I have no concrete issue for it yet. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jop. That was great. Thanks, guys. Um, if there's uh, guys, people, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. And um, the test is already live. You can go to the university page. I expect you all to make it. I'll still email you all. And uh, I already sent out the results for the last one. So if you didn't get that, it means you didn't make it. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Jop. Have a good night. Thanks. Cheers.